Hello Internet, and welcome to MedVIP. Today we're going to talk about projectile motion. Today is the first in a series of videos I hope to make about passage-based questions. These are passages that I own because I made them up. <laughs> Uh, and they're only going to have a couple questions in each video. The reason is to make sure that you guys actually have an adequate explanation of those concepts. My main focus isn't to make questions. There are plenty of people who do that better than me and have tons and tons of people working on that uh, and a huge payroll to do so. My expertise is to focus on explaining that and explaining it in a way that's tenable and graspable by not only undergraduates, but even those who may be taking uh, high school courses or not even yet thinking about taking for the MCAT. A physiologist is studying a group of high school shot put athletes. He begins with measurements of the average arm length and the average force during the throw, as shown in table one. So we look at table one, read the column headings, and we see grade, average force during the throw, and the wrist displacement in centimeters. So uh, we have newtons and centimeters, that's force and distance, and for those of you who are thinking ahead, you should be thinking that this has something to do with work, but beyond that, you don't really need to pay attention to Table 1 at this point. Notice that you should always read it in conjunction with the part of the paragraph that actually mentions that table, figure, or graph. The physiologist then leads the team through a series of exercises to determine how far they can throw the shot to determine who makes the cutoff for their next meet. Afterwards, to show off in an extremely dangerous way, the classes compete to see who can throw the shot straight up the highest. Infuriated to discover that they have been so reckless as to throw an iron ball with five kilograms mass so that it could land on their heads, he makes them run the following series of physics problems. Given the density of the shot, he tells them to ignore air resistance. Now, of course, this is a silly passage because I made it up. But the point is to learn how to read these passages and extract the relevant information. Some people like to highlight. I was never a huge highlighter unless it was a factoid, like a number buried in the text. And for those, I would absolutely highlight. Clearly this passage is going to have something to do with projectile motion because it's a shot put team. After highlighting all the relevant facts inside the text that are hidden, the other main goal of the passage reading is to get an idea of what kinds of questions you might be asked to sort of anticipate what's coming along. So that table has newtons and meters, which should give you force and distance, some sort of calculation based on work. We also have at least one trial where the uh, projectile is being thrown straight up and down. All right, on to question one. What is the maximum height above the point of release that the average junior can throw the shot straight up? We got a series of answers. They're all in meters. It's going to be a straight uh, projectile uh, problem, but it's one where, like I said, the projectile is being thrown straight up. And of course, question two, what is the maximum distance that the average freshman should be able to throw the shot? Now, maximum distance implies maximum range. So for those of you who are thinking ahead, there's a little bit of a trick to this, but we're gonna discuss these answers in just a second. All right, so the explanation for question one. Uh, they're asking for the maximum height above the point of release. So really they're only looking for the change in height here. The actual final height on some projectile problems is gonna depend upon where the initial height was, but here we're only asking for the difference in height. So we can just apply the formula much more simply to figure out the change in potential energy. So the concept here is that the muscular work that is done is going to give the object its initial kinetic energy, which will be all of the mechanical energy it has upon the point of release. Since there is no friction, that's also going to be exactly equal to the maximum amount of potential energy it will have at the peak of the parabola. Even though that's a skinny parabola because it's just up and down. And that of course gives us the final or maximum height that is achieved by the projectile. So the series of connections between the work of the muscles, the kinetic energy, the potential energy, and the change in height, that is the solution path. And the solution path is the logical chain that connects the givens to the final answer. So this concept of logical connections, this is a critical scale that will serve you from now until your last day in medicine. Now, some problems have longer solution paths, some ones have just shorter and straighter solution paths, some have branching or forking or merging solution paths. But the solution path is really the key to solving any problem. And to play off the Wu-Tang Clan, a test question is like a sword fight. You must think first before you move. All right, so let's start with that first concept in the logical chain, the work done by the muscles. 
Now, in order to get the work done by the muscles, we're going to need to apply that formula, force times distance. And since they're collinear, the cosine of theta is simply going to be 1. So because this is an average junior, we're going to have to look up that line in table 1, which gives us the force during the throw and the displacement of the wrist during the throw, because that's going to be the displacement of the shot. Well, for those of you who said, well, it's the displacement of the wrist, not the shot, can we make that assumption? Yes. Keep it simple. Don't read too much into the question. Just make sure that you're careful and don't skip steps in your calculation. When we read the third line in table one, we see that we got 406 newtons and 100 centimeters. Now, the problem is, of course, that newtons times centimeters is not a real unit, so we better go ahead and convert that 100 centimeters into meters. And of course, there's 100 centimeters in one meter, so conveniently enough, that's a distance of one meter. Now, if this sounds like an overly convenient number, it's not really an overly convenient number. The AMC will generally give you numbers that are easier than almost anything you're gonna find on the average test prep question. And once we have our givens as 406 newtons times one meter, we can actually cancel out and combine the units. So in this case, a newton times a meter combines to equal one joule. So 406 joules is equal to the work of the muscles and is also equal to the initial kinetic energy that the ball has, which given that there's no air resistance, means that that's also equal to the final potential energy that the ball achieves at the peak of its vertical motion. So that final potential energy is going to be equal to mg delta h, according to the formula. Now, why did I say delta h? Because the thing about potential energy you gotta remember is that there is no real meaningful zero. Potential energy is always defined relative to some point where we define it to be zero. So we define that to be the point of the release. However, the proper formula is not mgh, which would just imply some arbitrary height, but rather the change in height above the zero position. Rearranging to get the uh, delta h, we get uh, the potential energy divided by mg. So plugging in what we know, we get 406 joules for the potential energy final from our earlier calculations, five kilograms for the mass of the shot because of that part of the passage where the physiologist was angry at the students for engaging in this dangerous activity. And uh, g is one of the actual constants that the MCAT wants you to know. Now, this is not gravity. This is little g, the acceleration due to gravity. And while it is 9.81 meters per second squared downwards, we're going to go ahead and use 10 because we're not masochists. So combining the terms in the denominator, we're going to see 5 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared. And a kilogram times a meter per second squared is a unit of mass times a unit of acceleration, which should give us a unit of force, which is a newton. So we get 406 joules divided by 50 newtons. Now, of course, 406 does not get evenly divided by 50, so we're going to go ahead and estimate. And uh, that estimation is going to get us to 400 joules in the numerator divided by 50 newtons in the denominator. The first thing we're going to do is get rid of any unnecessary zeros when we're trying to simplify the numerator and denominator because tens just make everything unnecessarily complicated. There's two zeros in the numerator and one in the denominator, so we can only get rid of one, and so we do that. The next thing we do is simplify the units. Since we have joules in the numerator and newtons in the denominator, we're going to divide through, and a joule divided by a newton is a meter. Well, how do we remember that? Remember, force times the distance is work, which is energy. So newton times a meter is equal to a joule. So now that we've simplified as much as we can, we have 40 meters divided by five, which is around eight meters. So we take our prediction of around eight meters to the answer choices, and we see one of them matches really well, so we pick that and move on. So question two, what is the maximum distance that the average freshman should be able to throw that shot? So this is a range question. And specifically, because they're asking for the maximum distance that the freshman should be able to throw the shot, they're asking for a maximum range. Now, in order to answer that question and explain it properly, we're going to have to diverge a little bit into an actual lecture on projectile motion. So here you see an animated GIF of the projectile during its flight. And one of the reasons I like this GIF uh, is that it actually shows you how much of the speed of the projectile is directed in the x and y axes during the flight at the different points where the projectile passes. So, so notice initially that the uh, projectile has some vertical and horizontal components to motion, but eventually when it reaches it, its peak in the x axis, the object continues to move, but in the y axis, the object is basically just going up, stopping, and turning around going back down towards the negative y direction. After the uh, projectile has reached its peak, notice it's not moving in the y-axis any longer, so all of the velocity it has is directed in the horizontal direction. And if you look at the horizontal component of the velocity, you'll notice that it never changes during the entire flight, whereas the vertical vector that represents the velocity absolutely does change, first shortening, then becoming zero, 
then re-lengthening but in the negative direction. Without calculus, it's impossible to factor in air resistance because the size of the force of air resistance varies as a function of the speed and would constantly be getting smaller as the projectile constantly varies its speed throughout the parabolic arc. So there's no way of doing a smooth averaging or simplifying it for the MCAT. So for the MCAT and for those taking algebra-based physics, we always ignore air resistance. Heck, even for those taking calculus-based physics, it's a reasonable approximation to assume that the force of air resistance is negligible for a dense enough projectile. This really wouldn't work for a ping pong ball, but you see my point. The key to projectile motion is that both axes of motion should be considered separately. Since for the MCAT you always ignore the force of air resistance, the only force acting on the projectile is gravity, which acts only in the vertical axis. Thus, the horizontal component of motion goes unchanged, whereas the object's motion in the vertical or y-axis is an accelerated one. So the object will continue to move in a horizontal axis at a constant speed until it connects with the ground, at which point it will stop. In other words, the horizontal component of the velocity is constant for the entire duration of the time of flight. And you get the time of flight from the y-axis motion. The steeper the angle of launch, the more of that initial speed is directed straight upward, so the longer the projectile will spend in the air. However, the closer that angle theta gets to 90 degrees, the less horizontal velocity there is. Thus, the range is a trade-off between the time of flight and the horizontal velocity. To make that more clear, let's work on some generalized math. So, as you can see from this formula, the range is simply the horizontal velocity times the time of flight. Because v0x, the horizontal component of the velocity, is the side of the right triangle that is adjacent to the angle theta, it is the hypotenuse, the overall velocity vector, times the cosine of theta. If you didn't follow how to do that, don't worry, I'll be making a video on trig. Let me know in the comments below whether you'd like me to do that sooner rather than later. Also, take a moment to like and subscribe so that you get notified when all my videos come out. To figure out the time of flight, we need to look at the motion in the y-axis. We start by picking a kinematics equation to work with. For those of you who want to know how to pick and apply these equations, let me know in the comments. These videos will all come in eventually, but I want to make them in the order that you, my viewers, my tribe, need and want. Alternatively, you can check out my website, medvipvideos.com, for a brief written treatment. Of the three equations you must know, vax, vat, and exat, we need to know time so you can't use vax, which doesn't contain it. And since we don't know the vertical displacement, we can't use exat, which would really be yat in this equation. But, see, but either way, it doesn't matter, because what we're really going to use is vat. So what is vat? Again, check the website. <laughs> V final is equal to V initial plus acceleration times time. Now we have a choice in how we want to calculate. We could calculate the time it takes the projectile to reach the peak of its motion, which has the advantage of V final being zero, but has the disadvantage of making you have to remember to multiply by two at the end, and that's an easy way to lose points because it's one of the things that the AMC is really good at is creating distractors. And distractors pull you away based upon common mistakes of calculation and thinking that students will encounter. And remember, the key to testing strategy, both for the MCAT, the USMLE, and beyond, is error reduction. Leave yourself no chance to mess up and you will consistently grab points. So to do this problem in one step, we actually look at what the velocities will be when the projectile hits the ground on the far side of the parabola. The horizontal component of V final will be the same but the vertical component of V final will be the exact opposite of the vertical component of V initial because the parabola is symmetric. The acceleration for this falling object is simply little g, the acceleration due to gravity directed in the negative y direction. Rearranging for time of flight, we get two times the vertical component of the initial velocity divided by little g. The vertical component of the initial velocity is the hypotenuse, the overall initial velocity, times the sine of theta. Combining the algebra we did to get the formula for the time of flight, with the formula for the horizontal velocity, we can actually combine them to get a formula for the range in terms of the initial velocity and the angle theta. As we can see that the range depends upon the square of the initial velocity, just like the kinetic energy, right? Little g in the denominator is a constant, so that doesn't influence the range unless we were to switch planets. The only thing left is the trig terms. Because they're in the numerator, the range is proportional to the product of the sine and the cosine of theta. Since one gets bigger as the other one gets smaller in the domain 0 to 90 degrees, their product is the biggest when they're equal. For the geometry lovers out there, this statement is analogous to the idea that the area of a rectangle with a fixed perimeter is the greatest when the sides are equal, in other words, a square. 
as opposed to being long and skinny in either axis, as you can see from this little animation over here. Given that on the MCAT there are only five angles whose sine and cosine you need to know, their product is either zero, root three over four, or two over four, aka one half. Note that root three is roughly 1.7, which we can round down for the purposes of estimating the division to be 1.6. 1.6 over four is 0 0.4, definitely less than one half. So the largest value that the product of sine and cosine of theta can have is when theta is equal to 45 degrees or one half. It is not really worth working this out every time you have a projectile motion problem, but it's totally worth knowing that the maximum range that a projectile can achieve is when the angle of launch, theta, is 45 degrees. Take a look at this very colorful picture to hammer home the idea that you exchange horizontal velocity and time of flight to achieve range. Now that we've discussed projectile motion problems in general, I want to return your attention to some of the interim algebra we did so we can discuss how to do projectile motion problems in a consistent and pragmatic way, not always when they're asking you for the maximum range. Just keep in mind that the range is the horizontal velocity times the time of flight. So approach this problem like others in a top-down fashion. You can always get the horizontal velocity from applying trig to the initial velocity. You can always get the time of flight by applying the kinematics equations to the vertical axis of motion. I would suggest solving for those two things separately and always keeping your eyes on the prize and writing down the name of the variable that you're overall solving for as your very first step. Now that we've discussed the mechanics of what we'll do to arrive at the solution, let's actually get it done. So the work of the muscles gets us that initial kinetic energy, which we can use to calculate the initial velocity. Using the overall initial velocity and the angle of launch, we can get the horizontal and vertical components of the velocity. We can use the vertical component of the velocity to get time of flight and multiply that by the horizontal component of the velocity to get range. And that is the solution path for range problems. So this is Professor Sidney, Master of Physics. Unfortunately, he's a little cranky because this is past his bedtime, but that's the only reasonably quiet time I get to record. Every once in a while, he becomes a kitty projectile. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Professor Sidney disagrees with my teaching methods. So to do this from top down, remember, all we do is to get range, we keep in mind that we need the horizontal velocity times the time of flight. Remember that we can get the horizontal velocity just using trig, and we can get the time of flight by applying kinematics to the vertical axis of motion. So let's focus on the beginning of the solution path, how we get from work to the initial velocity. Again, the work done by the muscles is simply gonna be the force applied by them times the displacement of the wrist during the motion. So the work done by the muscles will be equal to the initial kinetic energy that the object has, which is going to be equal to one half times its mass times the initial speed it has squared. We can rearrange that last formula to solve for the initial speed that the object has, which is simply going to be the square root of two times its initial kinetic energy divided by its mass. So now that we've got all of our algebra out of the way, we can just plug and chug, yay! Looking back at the passage, we can see that the average freshman can apply 375 newtons of force during the throw, and that during that throw, they displace their wrist, and thus the shot, an average of 80 centimeters. Better yet, 0.8 meters. Better yet still, four-fifths of a meter. Keeping numbers in fractional form is useful because it allows you to simplify and cross out. Five divides the numerator nicely, so we get 75 newtons times four meters. And 300 newton meters is the same thing as 300 joules. The work done by the freshman's muscles will be the initial kinetic energy of the shot, in other words, 300 joules. And we can use that number to calculate the initial speed. Plugging into the formula we algebraized earlier, we see that we can cross out the denominator numerically. Five divides into 360 times, and 60 times two equals 120. We can also cross out the units. Remember, a joule is a kilogram times meter squared per second squared. Rewriting joules as its component units allows us to cancel out kilograms. What we have left is a square unit, which is great because it's under a radical. The number which is under the radical, 120, is actually not a square number, but it's really close to another number which is. So we estimate everything under the radical to be 121 meters squared per second squared. We can take the square root of that and then we can get our estimate of the initial to be 11 meters per second. Now that we have a value for the initial speed, we can calculate for the horizontal component of the initial velocity and the time of flight. It doesn't matter which order we calculate them in, so I choose to calculate the time of flight first because it's harder. Knowing the value for the initial velocity, we can just plug and chug here. 
You can see that the denominator for the sine term is 2, which can cross out the 2 that's already there in the overall numerator of the right-hand side of the equation. Looking at the units, we see that we have a fractional unit in the denominator. To eliminate it, we have to multiply by its reciprocal. That allows us to cross out everything except for a second in the overall numerator, which is part of our logic check since we are looking for time and getting units of time on the other side of the equation is part of t what tells us that we're on the right track. Notice that this doesn't help us with constants, but that's why the algebra step of the problem solving algorithm is such an important one. So our time of flight is 11 root two over 10 seconds. And until we're done calculating, it's best to keep things in fractional form because it makes any further calculations easier. Now that we have the time of flight, the last interim calculation we need to do is to get the horizontal component of the velocity, which in air resistance-less projectile motion problems is the same thing as the horizontal component of the initial velocity vector. We can plug and chug and we get that the horizontal velocity is 11 root two over two meters per second. Now that we have values for the horizontal velocity and the time of flight, we simply multiply them together. The seconds cross out, the root twos in the numerator multiply together to make two, which then crosses out with the two in the denominator. Thus, the range is 121 divided by 10, or 12.1 meters. Taking our prediction to the answer choices, we see that the closest match is C, 12.2 meters. Notice that the real answer is slightly larger than our estimate. And it is an estimate, since we divided by an estimate for little g, 10 meters per second squared, that was slightly larger than the actual value of 9.81 meters per second squared, making our estimate a little bit of an underestimate, which is part of our logic check and helps us gain confidence in our answer. And with that, we're out of questions and almost out of video, but not quite. Do the YouTube things, like, comment, subscribe, and stay tuned for the rest of the videos that are coming out this week. I know I started this channel off at a slightly different time in my work schedule, so I wasn't as uh, regular as I'd like to have been, but uh, I do this for you guys. Uh, you know, check out my website and see what else I can do for you, medvipvideos.com. Until next time, this is MedVIP signing off and reminding you, keep it simple.